It is good to see everybody today. Let's see if my clicker is working. Oh, that works. Okay, we're going to start the service the way we start the service every Sunday when I'm speaking. And this is the way I start most of my days because I want to make sure my head's in the right space and my attitude is right. And so I repeat the Pastor Mike paraphrase of Psalm 118, verse 24 which says, this is the day that God has made for me. I will be thankful and enjoy it. And that helps keep me focused in the right direction. Now, for the last few weeks, we've been talking about how Jesus told his disciples that they were salt and light. Salt is a preservative and a seasoning. That means that Jesus' disciples, when they're in the world, preserve the world, keep it healthy, keep it from decaying. It also is a seasoning. It means that they add something to the world. They make the world a better place. Then he also said they were light, which provides protection and direction. And then he says something interesting. He says, if salt loses its saltiness or light goes out or is hidden, it's worthless. And we asked the question, how does salt lose its saltiness? Or how does light lose or be hidden or go out? And we looked at a verse the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Colossae. And in Colossians 2.6, he said, And now, just as you've accepted Christ Jesus your Lord, you must continue to follow him. And that gives us a hint. You can have an introduction to Jesus and you can start a relationship with him and then not continue to follow him. And that's a mistake. Most of our problems come when we don't continue to follow Jesus. But how does that usually happen? Well, he goes on in verse 7. He says to let your roots grow down into him, let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you'll overflow with thankfulness. We have to let our roots grow down into Jesus. We have to base our lives on our relationship with Jesus. And when we do that, our hearts are overflowing with thankfulness. And he finishes up this section. He says, don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that comes from human thinking and from spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. And we've talked about how we are lied to all the time. And we are given ideas and philosophies and what Paul says, high-sounding nonsense. And the whole point is to get us to quit following Jesus, to quit putting our roots into Jesus, to quit building our lives on our relationship with Jesus. And so we've been looking at some of these false philosophies, some of this high-sounding nonsense. We started off by going all the way to the beginning and we looked at creation and we looked at the story of creation and how God created every aspect of this world that we live in and every time he did, he said it was good. And he created the world and it was good and he created the sun and the moon and the stars and it was good and he created the plants and it was good and he created the animals and it was good and he created man And said it's not good that man is alone. And so he created woman. The Bible says that he created people, male and female, he created them. And we've kind of made jokes about a little bit of high-sounding nonsense that's being thrown out nowadays that there aren't male and female. There are just all sorts of other things and you get to choose. And politely nonsense God told us what he did and when he completed creation he looked at it and said it was very good and then we looked at the temptation of Adam and Eve in the garden and found out that what the devil tempted them with was the ability to decide what was good and bad and he said if you take the job of deciding what's good and bad you will be like God because God gets to decide what's good and bad and when we start deciding what's good and bad outside of our relationship with God we start getting ourselves into some serious trouble 
and we look around our world today and we see that people are calling things that are really bad good and things that are good bad and it's causing a lot of trouble that's one of the things that we can get fooled by then we looked at how important it is in our culture to make sure that we're happy and in fact being happy is the number one goal of most people and that goes back to the first one we talked about because if something is ha if something is good it's because it makes us happy if something is bad it doesn't make us happy and we bring all this authority onto ourselves and it gets us into trouble last week we looked at how the world knows that something needs to be done but the truth is we all know something needs to be done and someone else should do it. And the funny thing is, in our world, we always seem to want to assume that the government's going to do it. As if we haven't been paying attention for the last few hundred years and seen that almost everything the government gets involved in, it screws up. Because it's not supposed to do that. Our government was set up for one reason, to protect the rights that God gave his people. It's not set up to do all this stuff. But we see things need to be done, and then we decide that someone else needs to do it. We all have wonderful ideas about what you're supposed to do. We know exactly what other people are supposed to do. The funny thing is, God doesn't tell you what other people are supposed to do. God tells you what he wants you to do. And so we found out that God has a plan for each one of us, and we are here on purpose. We are where we are on purpose, and God has a job for us to do, for us to do. Interesting. Today, we're going to keep that in mind as we go on to the next one. Now for some brief numbers. Do you know what the average size house was in the United States in 1950? 983 square feet. In 1970, it was 1,500 square feet. In 1990, it was 2,080 square feet. In 2014, it was 2,657 square feet. Now, to me, the irony is, at this same time as houses are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, American families are getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Now, am I saying there's something wrong with having a bigger house? Absolutely not. But the things that people were thankful for 70 years ago are not even usable today for most of us. We've allowed our heads to change because we all know bigger is better. I can remember being on vacation and we visited Mary Todd Lincoln's childhood home. That was Abraham Lincoln's wife. And we went up to the children's room and we saw the bed where all seven or eight children slept. And we sit there trying to figure out how they did that on this little bed. But the thing was, they were happy they had a bed. Nowadays, we get upset if we don't have our own room. And the kids that I would talk to in school, they would just be horrified to find out I didn't get my own room until I was 11 years old. You had to share a room with your brother? Yes, we had bunk beds. We know bigger is better, and there's nothing wrong with bigger. But we need to check our minds. Just interesting. Do you have any idea how many people were enrolled in college in 1965? 5.9 million people. In 1970? 8.6 million people. In 1980, 12.1 million people. In 1990, 13.8 million people. 
In 2000, 15.3 million people. 2010, 21 million people. 2020, it's 22 million people. Now let me ask you a real quick question. Are people better educated now than they were 50 years ago? Have you ever seen the man on the street interviews where they ask people very simple questions? One of my favorite game shows that was on years ago was Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? And they would quiz adults on fifth grade material. And the fifth graders would almost always beat the adults. But we've got millions upon millions upon millions of people in college, most of them borrowing a lot of money to do it, and they're not any more educated. But in our world, you have to go to college if you're going to succeed. It's interesting. Just for fun. Have you ever thought about what the average professional baseball player earns? In 1970, the average pro ball player made $29,303 a year, which in 1970 was a decent amount of money. But things have changed. In 1980, it had gone up to $143,756. In 1990, it had gone up to $597,537. In 2000, it was at a million eight hundred ninety-five thousand six hundred thirty dollars. This is the average. In twenty ten, three million fourteen thousand five hundred seventy-two dollars. By twenty twenty, four million four hundred ten thousand dollars a year. Now here's an interesting question: Are the ball players a lot better than they were in the fifties? Is baseball more fun to watch than it was in the 50s? No, all this shows is how much we're willing to pay people to entertain us. Now, am I saying it's wrong that they make this kind of money? Absolutely not. This is what the market bears. But it reinforces in our heads that bigger is better. More is better. And it's an idea and a philosophy that can cause us some problems. We absolutely know that bigger houses, bigger beds, bigger pools, bigger fridges, bigger ovens, bigger TVs and computer monitors, bigger cell phones are better. When we go to a restaurant, we like big portions. I looked it up. Do you know that Americans throw away 40 million tons of food a year? That's 80 billion pounds of food. You know why? Because we like to see a lot of food on our plates. We don't eat it all. We eat too much of it, but we don't eat it all. But in our heads, bigger is better. We are absolutely sure that if you want to accomplish something, especially something important, you need to be big and powerful. You need a lot of people and a lot of resources to do it. So my question is, what do you think God thinks about this? Well, I want to look at another Bible story. I love Bible stories. I was raised in Sunday school. We read Bible stories all the time. Now, I will be honest with you, there are a lot of stories in the Old Testament that we weren't taught in children's church because there is a lot of really weird stuff that people did that the Bible is very honest about. And they didn't tell us when we were seven years old about some of that stuff. But we read Bible stories all the time. I was raised with a children's Bible and we listened to records and we had storybooks and just all, I love Bible stories. And this story was one of my favorites. We can find it, oh, I'm sorry, bigger is better. I got a slide behind. This one is in the Old Testament book of Judges and starts in chapter 6. 
And let's go through this quickly. The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight, so the Lord handed them over to the Midianites for seven years. Now, by did evil, um, what that means is they quit worshiping God and started worshiping idols. They quit being in relationships with God's people, and they started seeking relationships with people who were opposed to God. They intermarried. They brought all these other religious activities into their houses, and their relationship with God deteriorated. And so they wanted to leave God. God let them leave. The Midianites were so cruel that the Israelites made hiding places for themselves in the mountains, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, marauders from Midian, Amalek, and the people of the east would attack Israel, camping in the land and destroying crops as far away as Gaza. They left the Israelites with nothing to eat, taking all the sheep, goats, cattle, and donkeys. These enemy hordes, coming with their livestock and tents, were as thick as locusts. They arrived on the droves of camels, too numerous to count, and they stayed until the land was stripped bare. So Israel was reduced to starvation by the Midianites. Then, I wonder how often I have waited until I was reduced to almost starvation to think, oh yeah. The Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. They had walked away from God. They had terminated their relationship with him. The Israelites had abandoned God, worshiped other gods, so God quit protecting them after seven years. Seven years! It finally occurred to them to call out to the Lord for help. Now they had really walked away. They'd walked away for seven years. But the interesting thing about God is no matter how far away from him you walk, he's always just one step back. You can walk away from him for seven years. And when you realize what a dumb move that was, and you turn around, he's there. We would think it'll take at least seven years to get back where we should have been. But that's not the way God works. God was there. Going on in verse 11. The angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree at Oprah, which is the correct spelling of the very famous name now. The woman we know as Oprah was supposed to be named after this, but they misspelled it. She tells, has told that story. Which belonged to Joash of the clan of Abiezer. Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of the wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites so it wouldn't get taken. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. He said it to a guy who's hiding in the bottom of a wine press trying to put some food together so his family can eat. And the angel of the Lord says, Mighty hero, How would you react if God approached you and addressed you as mighty hero? I know what it feels like to personally tell God he doesn't know what he's talking about. Because God has told me some things and I'm like, <laughs> no, wrong guy. Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? I can tell you why. Y'all walked away from God for seven years. You worshipped other gods. You took yourself out from beneath the protection of the relationship God has with his people. 
And when we do that, who do we always blame? God. Where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? You mean your ancestors that walked with God? Didn't they say, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, but now the Lord has abandoned us? Who abandoned whom? God has never abandoned us. But I bet at some point in time, each one of us has walked away. Now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Have you ever noticed God doesn't argue? Those are some pretty strong accusations. I've noticed that God almost never defends himself. It's an area where I can get distracted pretty easily. When I think people are wrong, I feel the need to convince them that they're wrong. And it almost never goes well. God just goes on. He says, go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. Go with the strength you have. Remember last week we read that God has already given us everything we need to live the godly life he created us to live? He didn't tell Gideon, well, I'll give you special superpowers. He said, go with what you already have. But Lord, Gideon replied, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I'm the least in my entire family. The Lord said to him, I will be with you, and you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. There are times when a lot of us will be very self-deprecating in hopes of fishing for a compliment. Gideon is going, well, but, but my family is the least family in the area and I'm the least member of the family. And God very politely ignored him. He says, I will be with you. You will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. When you are doing what God wants you to do, you are never alone. God is with you. So Gideon hops up and goes out and takes on the Midianites, right? Not even close. Not even close. This is one of the reasons that I have no doubt that the Bible is absolute truth because it is so honest about the people in it. If you were writing your autobiography, you would probably describe certain situations differently than someone else who was watching. I can tell all sorts of stories about my upbringing and I always seem to look pretty good. Nobody telling the story about Gideon is concerned with how Gideon looks. (laughs) Gideon doesn't remotely trust God or what God told him. In fact, he tests God with some pretty silly tests. Gideon gets a piece of fleece, some sheep's wool, and he puts it on the ground and he says, God, if you're really talking to me tonight, Put dew all over the ground, but not on the fleece. Because, you know, that has 
real application to this situation. And Gideon got up the next morning and there was dew all over the ground, nothing on the fleece. And Gideon says, okay. Well, tonight, I'm going to put another fleece on the ground. And this time, don't put any dew on the ground, but put dew on the fleece. And for some reason, God said, okay. And they got up the next morning and there was no dew on the ground, but the fleece was wet. And so Gideon said, okay, but let's try the first one again. I'm going to put another fleece on the ground and put dew all over the ground, but not on the fleece. And for some reason, God said, okay. And he did it. Now, the funny thing is, this demonstrates a complete lack of faith and knowledge of God. And, for someone like Gideon, it completely violates the scripture in Deuteronomy that says, do not test the Lord your God. But God went along with it. So finally, Gideon gathers 32,000 men to go fight the Midianites. Which, by the way, was not nearly enough. Historical evidence figured the Midianites probably had an army of 60 to 100,000 men. But Gideon could come up with 32,000. And God says, tell you what, ask the men if they're afraid to go fight. And if anybody says they're afraid to go fight, send them home. And he asked them, and 10,000 of them left. So now he's got 22,000. 32,000 was not enough, but now he's got 22,000. Um, let's see. Did I get those numbers wrong? No, I'm sorry. 22,000 left. That left him with 10,000. Then God told them to go get a drink of water. They went to the river, get a drink of water. And God says, pay attention, Gideon. There are going to be guys that get down to drink and they're going to scoop up water in their hands and they're going to drink it. And there are going to be guys that get a drink and they're just going to put their face in the river like a dog and drink it that way. Pay attention, because whoever puts their face in the river and drinks that way, send them home. Okay, there's the 10,000. Of the 10,000, 9,700 of them drank by putting their face in the water. And Gideon had to send them home. That left him with a grand total of 300. We've got a problem because we all know bigger is better and we all know that more is better. And Gideon's down to 300 guys. So God gave them these instructions. Now take the 300 guys, divide into three groups, give each man a ram's horn and a clay jar with a torch in it. On Gideon's signal, blow the horns and break the jars. What? One of these days, I hope everybody gets the experience of having the person in charge tell them to do something that does not make any sense. Because you get to decide. Do I trust them? Have you ever had God tell you to do something that did not make any sense? I have. It's always an interesting situation. 
Let's see what happens. In Judges chapter 7 and verse 19, it was just after midnight, after the changing of the guard, when Gideon and the hundred men with him reached the edge of the Midianite camp. Suddenly, they blew the ram's horns and broke their clay jars. Then all three groups blew their horns and broke their jars. They held the blazing torches in their left hands and the horns in their right hands, and they all shouted a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Each man stood at his position around the camp and watched as all the Midianites rushed around in a panic, shouting as they ran to escape. When the 300 Israelites blew their horns, the Lord caused the warriors in the camp to fight against each other with their swords. Those who were not killed fled to places far away as... I can't figure out how to say that without getting myself in trouble. I know how the internet works. There's going to be this one two and a half second clip of me saying that. And you all are going to email it to your friends. They fled to places far away as Barstow, near Zarahah, <laughs> and to the border, Abel Meloa, near Tebeth. I still get goosebumps when I read that story. Why do I have to remind myself that God is God? God is God. I remember several years ago, sitting in a movie theater, watching the animated movie, The Prince of Egypt. And to me, it was an amazing experience. And I got quite frustrated with the various church people that I knew who could pick out all the ways that the story wasn't exactly the way they thought it should be and missed the grand picture of this thing and the story that it told. And there's a place when the Israelites are on the, the side of the Red Sea and the Egyptians are coming after them. And this pillar of fire smashes down in front of the Egyptian army. And I leaned over to Rhonda and I said, God says, don't mess with my people. Why do we forget that God is God? Gideon and his men didn't even have to fight. They stood there and watched what God did. Remember what Paul told us when we were talking about the armor of God? When you've done all to stand? Stand? Oh, but we need to go fight. If God tells you to fight, fight. But what the Bible says is stand where he puts you. In the book of Zechariah in the Old Testament, God says this. They didn't have to fight. God says in Zechariah 4, 6, Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. You will succeed because of my spirit, though you are few and weak. It ain't us. It's God. We read this several weeks ago in 2 Chronicles 20, 15. This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid. Don't be discouraged by this mighty army for the battle is not yours, but God's.
The battle is not yours. The battle is not mine. The battle is not ours. The battle is God's. Now, you might say, well, Pastor Mike, we know there are stories like that in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament. But surely you know that stuff like that doesn't happen today in the real world, right? Maybe. Maybe we're not paying attention. Let's go back to December 1937. The Japanese Imperial Army has just marched into the Chinese capital city of Nanking. I can't even read this story out loud. After a six-week period, they murdered up to 600,000 civilians and military. They decimated the city. It was the single worst atrocity in all of World War II. 50,000 Japanese soldiers were given orders to kill all the captives. The first to be eliminated were 90,000 Chinese military POWs. The young Japanese soldiers were told to inflict as much pain and suffering as possible so that they'd be tougher for future battles. By the way, the Japanese documented all of this torture with pictures, film, and detailed records. Then the Japanese turned their attention to the civilians. The unbelievable carnage, citywide burnings with people locked in buildings, stabbings, drowning, strangulations, rapes, killing contests. There was a beheading contest that was listed in every day's newspaper between two soldiers to see who could cut the heads off more civilians that day. And this was publicized. It continued without interruption for, like I said, about six weeks. Did the world know what was going on? Yes. It was written about in the New York Times. It was covered by Time Magazine. And people would read the stories and go, ah, that can't be true. But I understand we're in church and I'm really just glossing over the high points. Then, a group of about 20 U.S. missionaries who were there working with the Red Cross declared a two and a half square mile area in the center of the city as a safety zone. And they went out and they put Red Cross flags at the corners and told the Japanese, you don't get to come in here. Twenty. And the Japanese didn't go in. And these 20 missionaries saved 300,000 people. Everyone who made it in survived. Everyone who didn't was killed. These were not armed people. These were not soldiers. These were missionaries who simply stood up to the greatest military force in Asian history and said, no, not here. That makes no sense unless you remember <laughs> that God is with us.
it's one of the strangest stories of World War II. These people had no chance of making any sort of an impact. They simply stood to lose their lives. Yet the Japanese military wouldn't cross the line. They set up a safety zone using Red Cross flags. They declared a two and a half square mile area in the middle of the city off limits. Often they went outside the safety zone and personally intervened in murders, beatings, and rapes and stopped them and took the people into the safety zone. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. You will succeed because my, of my spirit, though you are few and weak. This stuff still happens to the few people who believe it. God doesn't need a huge group of strong, well-trained, and armed people to do his work. He'll do his work with anyone who will go with him. Bigger is not always better. More is not always better. You and God are enough. You and God are a majority. Because folks, we got to remember God is God. And for some reason, he wants us to work with him. And this brings us back to what Paul told the church at Colossae. Just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots go down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that comes from human thinking and spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. There is no limit to what can be done if we continue to follow Jesus. And if you ever feel discouraged and you ever feel like there's nothing that can be done, remind yourself of 20 missionaries standing up against the Japanese Imperial Army and saving 300,000 people. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for allowing us to get together today and spend time with our church family in your presence. Thank you for the encouraging word and the stories that you tell us in the Bible that remind us again and again who you are and how fortunate we are to be your children. Father, there's so much that you want to do. And you want us to do it with you. And we thank you for that. So Father, I thank you for everyone who's here today. I thank you that your hand of blessing and protection is on each and every one of us. And I thank you as you start revealing the things that you have planned in the areas that you are wanting us to go. And I look forward to hearing what's happening. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.